Hey guys, welcome this weekend to Mercy Hill Online. Before we dive in, I want to uh, sort of speak to what I talked about a little bit last week. I know with phase two opening in North Carolina, a lot of questions about when Mercy Hill is going to reopen. Uh, Y'all, what I said last week was this, Mercy Hill doesn't need to open because the church never closed, okay? Uh, Man, the church is not a building. The church is a movement and movements move. uh, They adapt, they shift. And that is certainly what has gone on over the last couple of months as we have been walking through this pandemic as a church. Um, Guys, I think about all the cool things that we have seen. Man, we've never stopped being the church, okay? Maybe we stopped coming to the buildings, but we didn't stop being the church, nor will we. Uh, Man, we've seen so many people people diving in to no more spectators. We have seen, um, get this, we could celebrate this, over a hundred people in the last two months have onboarded to giving for the first time uh, at Mercy Hill. We have seen so much happening with our international work, our, our Roanoke church planning team is about getting ready to go. I mean, guys, the thing has not stopped. There's so much going on. I want you to know that I look forward to the day so much when we get back together again. I think we all do. Man, our kids worshiping together, man, singing the wonderful praises of God together in our campuses. That is going to be a wonderful day, uh, but I don't wanna confuse that with the church not rolling. We stopped coming to the buildings, but we never stopped be in the church and we're not going to stop being the church. So we're gonna commit to keep you guys updated on things that are coming and changes and getting our you know, our staff back in the office and get, getting our campuses back opened up again. Man, we are full, uh, ahead, you know, full speed ahead with those things and looking forward to that. But at the same time, man, let's not wait for something to reopen that never closed, okay? So let's keep our foot on the gas and keep moving. All right, we're gonna be in Romans chapter eight. If you have a copy of scripture, uh, I'd, like to take, I'd like for you to take it out and turn with me there. We're gonna be in Romans 8, 22 through 25, as we continue um, sort of this methodical kind of walk that we are doing through uh, one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible. Y'all, it's the highest mountain in the range. It's kind of the greatest chapter of the greatest letter of the greatest book in all of the world. And so we've been spending and some time in it. And here's what we're going to end up seeing today. This is the big idea. Y'all, future glory is worth the wait, okay? Last week, we talked about how creation groans, but that groaning uh, is about something that is coming, that glory that is coming. It groans because it sees a joy that is out there, as Paul spoke of creation, kind of personified creation, and said creation groans, it waits for the glory of God to be revealed. And today we're gonna see that uh, in our lives as as well. That even though waiting involves groaning, even though waiting involves uh, patient endurance, uh, even though waiting involves pain sometimes, isn't waiting kind of painful at times? Um, Man, it is. We wait that way for the glory of God. Let me ask you this. Uh, Maybe this will help get us thinking about it, right? Is waiting for something fun? I think the emphatic answer to that is no. Is it really awesome that in life there are things that are worth waiting for? The answer is yes, right? Man, nobody wants to wait. There's a pain in waiting because waiting and hoping in something is being certain of something that you have not yet tasted. It's like, man, we're excited about what's coming. The image that came into my mind was the one that I think anybody who's ever been in this spot knows uh, what I'm talking about. But uh, man, do you remember? What were they, what were they called? The, what, what was it? Oh yeah, movie theaters, okay? Does anybody remember ever going to uh, a movie theater? And I don't mean like a super nice, uh, I don't know where you're watching this from, movie theater like, like at the Palladium or something around High Point. I'm talking, about, uh, I'm talking about the one you walk in and you wait for the lights to get dim before you walk in because you don't know when it's been cleaned and your feet are just crunching. They're just, they're sticking to the floor. You know what I'm talking about, right? If you've ever been in a movie theater with a kid, and this is my point today, if you've ever been in there with a kid, here's what you know. Uh, Man, a kid, the the whole idea of waiting on the show to start, man, they're up and down. They're asking you, when's it going to start? When's it going to start? You know? As soon as the lights start to dim, they, they can't understand why there's so many previews. You know, there's angst about it. There's a, a, a jumping up and down. There's sort of a, almost, I know it's a little bit lighthearted, there's almost a pain in it. And the pain is not because they dread what is coming, it's because they're excited about what is coming. 
And that's what the Spirit of God, when he breaks into our life, he gives us, he creates a groaning in our life because we so look forward. A painful yet hopeful, characterized, you know, characterized by kind of this, this angst, that is the waiting with eagerness and with endurance that we are called to. And that's what we're going to look at today, all right? We're going to dive in. Let's walk line by line then towards the end of the message. Man, we'll try to wrap this stuff up and try to apply it in some ways that we can think about waiting well, all right? Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 22. Let's just walk through it line by line here. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation... But we ourselves, see, that's what we're going to get into today. Not just creation, but us as well, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Last week, we looked at the brokenness of creation, uh, which I don't know needs a whole lot of explanation. It's like, hello, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. This is not the world that God created in the beginning. It groans, it waits. Paul personified creation when he said, you know, basically creation is on its tiptoes trying to catch a glimpse. It's waiting, for, longing for the glory to come, the bondage to decay, the slavery uh, to decay, to be over. Jesus brings more freedom, not less. Even uh, his salvation is cosmic in scope as the creation is also it's going to see its suffering outweighed by future glory. But now it says this, like creation, we also groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. Humans along with creation create a symphony of sighs that collect kind of breathe in. <sighs> you know, they're just that groan of like, man, when is it going to be over? When are we going to see the glory come? Creation's waiting for it. Humanity is waiting for it. They are longing for their deliverance. They're longing for the slavery to this world and its decay and bondage, the down escalator that it is, all of its kind of winding down. We know that. We're waiting for that to be over. All right. Now, I think the point here that he makes is pretty emphatic if you look at the last three or four weeks, and it's this. Here's what he said. All right. We suffer, but it's outweighed by glory. That was three or four weeks ago. Then he said, wait, like us, creation suffers, but it's going to be outweighed by glory. And now what does he do this week? He says, oh, he's back to us again. And now he says, like creation, we are going to have our suffering outweighed by glory. It's a little bit like the song that never ends. You guys ever heard that? Your kids ever do that? All right. Quickest way to get the, that uh, song that never ends to end is just threaten to spank them. Okay, they'll stop. That's what I had to do. No, I'm, I'm just joking. Uh, but the point is undeniable here, all right? Present pain will give way to future glory. He said it to us. Uh, present pain will give way uh, to future glory. He says it to us. Uh, he says it again to, about creation. And now he ends up saying it uh, about us again. The illustration he gives, I think here, is the best one on earth. And that is this. Are the pains of childbirth, remember what he said, look at verse 22, the pains of childbirth, are those pains real? Yes, okay, they are so real. Are they worth it? Yes, it's really a great illustration. Uh, are the pains real? Absolutely. If you've ever been in the room, you know uh, that they are real. There is angst there. There is agony there. And yet, there is hope and there is a moment that is filled with joy. I thought this was interesting long before uh, Jim Elliott and Pete Fleming ever gave their lives on the, uh, on the bank, the sandy banks of the Kure River uh, in Ecuador for the Alka Indians. Maybe some of you are familiar with that martyrdom story. Uh, they were actually doing work among the Quechua in Ecuador, not to be confused with the Quechua, I learned, okay, the Quechua uh, in Ecuador, and they were doing work there. And while they were doing that work, one day one of the little boys comes running and knocks on their door and he says, you guys got to help us because my sister is dying. Now, this was what was interesting. In Quechua, someone is considered dying if they are not perfectly healthy. Okay, so anything that is not perfect health is, con so they say we're dying. He, you know, he says, my sister's dying. They don't know, does that mean a headache? Does that mean a mortal wound? It turns out their sister was giving birth. And the way that they talked about that was she's dying. Why? Because it certainly looks like that, doesn't it? There is pain. There is groaning. It feels more like death, but it's hopeful because in the end, there is joy. And I think what Paul is trying to get us to see uh, this weekend is this, that that, is the character, that characterizes the position of a Christian in this world. All right. He says in verse 23, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. What he's saying is because we understand the joy, the pain is reoriented. 
everybody suffers. Now we're going to understand that, okay? Now you just look around at the world and what you're going to realize is that everybody suffers. But there is something different about a Christian. Now what is, what is it saying about a Christian? The ones who have the first fruits of the Spirit, their suffering is characterized differently. It's characterized as a groan. In the Greek that means a cry for deliverance. Somebody who has been oppressed that is waiting to get out. That's more what Christians have. They have this groaning in them that says, God, I know you're going to do something in the future. And he gives us what that is. Y'all, that's the Spirit in us. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit has broken through from the future and creates a groan in us now. Hey, you remember, uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, all the 80s movies, okay? Uh, Man, some of the best 80s movies. What what would you put in that category? Princess Bride, maybe? I don't know. Uh, You you definitely put Karate Kid in there. And I'm not talking about, no, Jackie Chan, Karate Kid. I'm talking about Mr. Miyagi, the true Mr. Miyagi, uh, you know, Karate Kid. What's the other one that goes in there? Back to the Future goes in there, right? Every uh, time travel movie that I've ever seen does the same thing. It takes where you are and it moves you either backwards or forwards. That's every time travel movie that's ever been out there, okay? What the Bible is saying, though, is what the Spirit of God has done is the opposite. We don't go there yet. It has come here. The future has broken into the now, and that little piece of the future breaking in, the Spirit of God convincing us, remember some of the past language, that we are the children of God, that we will have the adoption, that we will have the redemption of our bodies, that we are destined for a a place where there are no tears. All of those things come together and it creates in Christianity a different eternal perspective on suffering where suffering turns into a groan for deliverance. You could could say it like this, y'all. Every human suffers, but not every human groans. Not every human groans as a Christian does as they begin to see what God is going to do and they long for it here. Oh, we live uh, in times of suffering and I understand that and that creates in us um, a real um, propensity to want to think about maybe moving into meaninglessness. You know, maybe thinking about, man, the suffering in this life sort of sort of causes, you know, the suffering in this life sort of causes us to just kind of look into the abyss and feel like there's nothing there and it can be crushing to us. Not so for the Christian. Y'all, for the Christian, it is the Spirit of God in your life that reorients that suffering. You know, I've heard people say like, man, you know, you want to get saved. You want the Spirit of God to come in because it's, it's going to solve all the angst in your life. Man, the Spirit of God creates angst in your life, all right, because there are things that you saw that you didn't even realize were such an offense to God. You didn't even see them as being as wrong as they are. I mean, the Spirit comes in and creates a groaning. The new nature brings a new appetite, all right? And we long for something that we can't get in this world. Yes, the Spirit of God comes in and brings a great expectation that honestly causes a little bit of frustration in the life that we live now. And the Bible calls that the groaning that we see. Hey, the opposite of this is where many of us are today. Man, you don't see suffering in this life as groaning. You don't see it as as a deliverance cry for the next world to come. Instead, you stare off into the abyss and what you see is, man, this world feels like a play where the the actors are are just kind of uh, filled in this meaningless, dark, comedic tragedy, you know? And there's nothing else out there. Man, the last couple of months, maybe you've begun to think this way in your life. It's brought financial uncertainty. It's brought relational strain. It's brought medical issues. Maybe not with COVID. Maybe it's the fact that there have been things that have been put off because we couldn't do them during COVID. And now that's created other issues. Maybe you had issues in your life that have turned into addictions and you feel like you're looking into the abyss and you feel like the world is no more than chaos. What the Bible is telling us today is that it will be no more than chaos until we can see it within the context of the glory that is coming. It will be, it will just be meaningless suffering until we, it's just like thinking about the, the childbirth. It's the greatest analogy. The suffering is meaningless until you begin to realize, wait a minute, there is a deep joy that is coming. That's what the Bible is trying to get us to see, that our eternity and our eternal view orients the way we view suffering now. It turns from suffering to a groan for the believer. How does that happen? Man, maybe you're pining for that. Man, God has something for you, and it's basically the gospel message. Listen, Jesus Christ came to turn your suffering into groaning. I'd love to talk to you more about that. We would love to talk to you more about that. If you want to get in touch with us, and there's ways to do that on any platform that you're seeing this, Facebook, YouTube, on our church website, whatever it is. But I want you to hear today that Jesus Christ came to take what was hopeless and fill it with hope. He came for those who were suffering in silence and to give them the idea of a hopeful groan. He came to guarantee you the freedom of, from the decay of this life. This is what our God has come to do. Man, without Jesus Christ, that is a fantasy. You know, the problem with sin in this world is this. 
when we think about sin and we think about suffering, there is a connection there. Because you know what? What the Bible says is that our sin deserves the wrath of God. It actually deserves a place called hell, which the suffering there is not comparable to anything we see in this life. And so there's a rub. We've got to realize, man, our sin created a situation where we deserve the wrath of God and suffering to fall upon us. But Jesus Christ took the penalty for that sin, and he gives us the hope of redemption. This is how suffering turns into groaning for the believer. The Spirit of God, that's what he got into, right? The Spirit of God, the first fruits, the Spirit comes in, and now we groan, we wait for its fullness. What are we waiting for? Well, if we already know that a believer through faith becomes legally a child of God, what does it mean here? Let's keep reading. We're waiting for the adoption. We're waiting for the redemption. Look what it says in verse 24. For in this hope, well, actually verse 23, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly, this is what we're waiting for, for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Y'all, there's a lot that we could say here, but I think you can boil most of this stuff down into one statement, and it's this. Our hope rests in a future glory, okay? And that future glory has a definition in this passage. You say, okay, what are we waiting for? What are we hoping for? Future glory. What is future glory? In this passage, it's actually very connected to last week, the revealing of the sons of God. It is this, the adoption and the redemption, we are waiting for the adoption and the redemption. That is what makes us antsy for the next life. That is what makes us like, man, you know, you're like that kid. The, 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 the lights are dimming and you're waiting for the show and you just can't stop. Like you are eager and you're hopeful about what is coming. It's all about the adoption and the redemption. You know, uh, I think about this. I, I mentioned it in the intro. Hey, a kid acts a lot different when you're talking about something that's coming that they're looking forward to. You know, the, you know, waiting is involved in waiting for the movie to start, and waiting is also involved in getting your name called when you're going to go get your teeth cleaned at the dentist. But if you've ever been with a seven-year-old, you know the posture's a lot different. The posture of the child is waiting eagerly for what is coming. That's our posture as well. You know, I was thinking about this with the, with the movie thing uh, a few, I can't remember what it was now, maybe, maybe, even, maybe even a year ago, a couple years ago, um, this movie Peter Rabbit was coming out. So I took my, my older kids and we went to go see Peter Rabbit. We get there and Peter Rabbit is not, they, they've already sold all the tickets, okay? So I got, I, he was probably three or four years old at that time and, and then maybe seven or eight year old, nine, nine ten year old uh, with me. I'm like, well, we'll just watch this other movie, uh, Sherlock Gnomes, okay? Can never get that hour and a half of my life back. <laughs> I promise you that. All right, but they, they get in there and they're loving it. You know, they just love it. And I'm sitting next to my son, Benaya, and dude, he's just crushing it, man. He's already crushed his icy. He's all the way through the popcorn. He's just sitting there, you know, got his, got his feet kind of dangling. I mean, we're an hour into the movie and he's sitting there, just the best posture, all that. And he, he leans over to me, and about an hour, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 minutes left in the whole movie, okay? He leans over to me, and he says, Daddy, when's Peter Rabbit going to come out, <laughs> right? All right? And it, it took me off guard. I'm like, man, this dude has been waiting patiently for the movie to start. He thinks all of this is like previews for an hour. And I just did what any dad would do. I looked at him. I was like, hey, bud, he's coming right up. Keep eating your juju for, you know, I didn't know what else to do. Um, and so I just, but I think about, if you've ever been in that situation with a kid, it's like, man, they're willing to wait. They're willing to endure. They're antsy about it. They're waiting eagerly because of what is coming. Now, you got a kid in the dentist's office. It's a totally different deal, right? What the Bible is saying for us is that we wait eagerly. We hope with endurance. That's what we're going to see in a minute. Why? Because of the adoption. Because this hope is ours, the adoption and the redemption of our bodies. Listen, I just want to ask this simple question. Does waitingness, eagerness, anticipation, and hope, does that characterize your life when you think about what's coming, you know? Maybe I can just say it more simply. Do we hope today in the final adoption? Or do we just hope in whatever's next in our life? Do we hope we're getting back to the next normal you know, to the new normal that, you know, that we're going to be in and we're wanting to get back to an old type of life or we're, we're man, we're, we're hoping today in, in the next opportunity or some other kind of life change circumstance or are we hoping today in the redemption of our bodies in a real sense, the hope, and this is so interesting to me in this passage, okay? Because what he says is we're saved in hope. Spurgeon said it like this, we're saved by faith, but in hope. Okay, there is a real sense at which the hoping in what Jesus has come to secure. I mean, you could ask the question, how can we say we've placed faith in Christ if we have no hope in what he came to bring? 
If we have no hope today anchored in what he is going to bring us, yes, we're saved by faith, but we are saved in hope. And in some real sense, it is in that hope. Man, our hope is what brings the hope of adoption. Our hope is what secures that we will end up seeing the redemption of our bodies. It's all wrapped up together, faith in Christ, man, hoping in what he is going to do. Now, I know that the question might come up, and I've thought this as well, maybe you think this, you think, wait a minute, why would we hope in the adoption? Andrew, we've talked about that, like from the moment you get saved, you are a child of God, like you place faith. Why would we hope in the adoption and the redemption? Like what else is there that we are hoping on? Is there a second blessing? Is the Holy Spirit being withheld? Is something like, man, it's none of those things. I can explain it as simply as this. Y'all, we are legally the children of God. We place faith in Christ, but the fullness of the experience we wait on. You know, I remember a couple, of, a couple in our family, a couple in our church family here, Robin and uh, Greg and Robin, you know, they, they went through a long, prolonged adoption scenario. Okay, it was a long story. And, uh, and that story, man, ended up taking Robin all the way to live in Uganda for months, okay, to bring home uh, Erina and Simone. And what ended up happening was they had three kids here, but they're going through this adoption process that's months long. And now Robin is living over there. And I remember it very uh, you know, sharply in my mind, because there, was a, there, there came a time when we ended up doing kind of a little daddy-daughter camp out thing, and Greg took the girls that were still here because they had three biological daughters after, before, you know, before the adoption, and we were there one night, and a couple of dads are sitting by the fire, and all the girls are going to bed, and his youngest daughter is just crying for mama. When is mama coming? Where is mama? She'd already, Robin had already been gone for months at this time. And Greg had to say, you know she's going to get your sisters and all that. And it was just, man, man, there was many of us that were locked up in with them and fasting and prayer through this whole situation. And it's kind of a miracle story. But anyway, what ended up happening was that we ended up seeing them uh, come, you know, ended up seeing the girls come home. And when the girls came home, we ended up seeing this great reunion at the airport. And this reunion was, man, it was filled with biological family and church family and all of that. And here they come. And man, everybody was crying. And it was just one of the most incredible experiences um, that I have really ever seen in terms of a church family coming together and the amount of prayer and all that kind of stuff. Here's the thing. Those kids were already legally theirs, but they had yet to meet the fullness of the family they were being brought into. Nobody had showed them their room yet. <laughs> Nobody had showed them what it looks like to live in a family. You see what I'm saying? Like the legality of it was already settled, but at the same time, the fullness of the experience was on this side of the ocean. And that's, I think, a very good analogy for what we're seeing here. Y'all, that day comes and we will have the fullness of the experience. And we've been sort of talking about this, you know? Man, a life that is filled with never saying, my life will be better when, you know? Man, a, a world with no broken relationships, with no trafficking, with no abortion, with no racism, Man, with none of the groanings that we see in the earth right now, with no asthma, right? Man, we are already legally the children of God if we have placed our faith in him, but we await a future glory. And, and by the way, what he says is like, man, if we could already see it, it wouldn't be hope. One, one, one commentator said it like this, hey, nobody hopes for the ship that they can already see in the harbor, you know? They look out and they scan eagerly because they're waiting for it to arrive. That is how we are. We don't see it yet in fullness. But the Bible promises it to us and our hope uh, is anchored in it. Here's the application, y'all, for this weekend. Man, let's wait well for future glory, all right? Let's wait well for future glory. One pastor said it like this. This world is filled with groaning. The next will be filled with, with glory. And we live in the in-between. We groan inwardly because we live in this world, but we long for that world. Man, we get our eyes fixed on that world. We learn how to wait with eagerness. We learn how to wait well with endurance. We learn how to not give up, how to fight against fatigue, how to keep our eyes on what is coming. And it changes so much about our everyday life. Now, I wanna try to put flesh on this with the remainder of my time. And let's, uh, let's talk about what it looks like to wait well, okay? What does it look like to wait well on the future glory that is coming? Well, I wanna pull it straight from this passage. Verse 23 told us to wait with eagerness, okay? So that's obviously a part of it. And verse 25 told us to wait with patience. Now, that word patience in Romans chapter five is actually translated endurance, the point, the point here is that we wait with eagerness and that we wait with a patient endurance. Two things, waiting well is about eagerness and waiting well is about endurance, all right? And it is about both. We don't wanna fall off on one side or the other. And what I wanna show you is this, man, we can become so eager that we end up with our, our head in the clouds and we end up getting knocked around because this earth is still where we live and it's still pretty hard. 
At the same time, if our mind is too far into endurance, then we can end up being a people who just kind of put our head down and have no hope and don't have that fire in our stomach. Man, an old time preacher would say it like this, man, you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Right, and you also don't wanna be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. Like we've got, we've got to find that sweet spot in the middle and I think we can, eagerness and endurance, okay? Number one is eagerness. What does that mean? Man, I want it, I can't wait for it. I feel like the lights are dimming and the show is about to begin and I just wanna see it, I wanna take it in. That's eagerness. I, I wanna wait, for, I, I, I'm happy about what is coming. It's not passive, y'all, it's active. Okay, there is an eagerness here. Now, uh, you know, what, what, is, what, is, what does it mean to wait eagerly? Let's just kind of talk this around for just a minute. I think waiting eagerly uh, maybe looks like waiting without passivity, without apathy. It looks like waiting without laziness in our life. You know, you, you think about some other places in the Bible. Man, when you see the parable, you know, when you have the, the story of the 10 virgins, man, they weren't waiting passively, they were getting their lamps ready. When you see the parable of Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, it's like, man, the master leaves and he leaves money with three different people and two of them eagerly invest it. Like, man, he gave me this and I want to turn it into this. I want to get at least interest back and, and invest and move things around because I'm eager for his return to show him what I have done. Of course, the other person in that parable did nothing, went and buried the money. And when the master came back, it's like, man, you didn't do the right thing. You weren't waiting eagerly for me. You were waiting in total passivity. You were waiting in apathy. Y'all, what does it look like for us to, 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 to wait in eagerness? I think it looks like, man, us throwing ourselves into ministry, us being obedient with our time, talent, and treasure, us paint a picture with our life that declares this world is not my home. Man, it looks like waiting uh, in a way that fights against anxiety and worry and depression. I understand those are some emotions that people are feeling right now, and I fully understand that, that some of those things might feel like we're wired for them, but at the same time, man, the Bible calls us away uh, from having manifestations of anxiety. And so what we've got to do is wait with hope and train ourselves. Man, fix your eyes on the gospel, what he has not only done, but what he is going to do and allow that to fuel the way that we feel, okay? The second thing is not just waiting with eagerness, though. It's waiting with endurance, okay? And this is what I want to say, and I hope I can get this across. I'm not even sure the exact way to say it. But if all we are is, uh, is eager, you know, and I feel like that ends up manifesting itself and kind of bouncing around in this life and always just, man, we're, we're never thinking about anything but, but heaven and, and, and just, you know, trying, trying to put us, maybe trying to put a smile on every situation in this world and all of that. Y'all, it scares me because here's what I think, and maybe this isn't even a great way to say it, but it's the best way I can. If we're only eager about the next life, how in the world are we going to survive this one? <laughs> We've got to have a realness to us. There's gotta be a wisdom and a depth and a staying power to our life. Man, it's been a couple years, but you, some of you guys know my story about Okie Finoki Joe, all right? I grew up uh, in, in, in North Florida, and at that time in the 80s, all right, what they did a lot of times was this guy would go around to uh, different uh, elementary schools, and he would do kind of a talk on what it looks like to be out in nature in the woods and all that. Man, Florida's a treacherous place, okay? There's like more, you know, snakes and alligators and, man, eat crazy. I mean, even in some of the, uh, you know, brackish water, there'll be like sharks. And, I mean, just there's a lot going on. And so they'd have this guy come in. Well, Okie Finoki Joe, and you can still look him up, all right? This dude walked into the swamp and lived there for like 30 years in the Okie Finoki Swamp in South Georgia, all right? And he would go to these different schools and he would, sure enough, bring like a six foot long diamondback rattlesnake right into the school's cafeteria and plop that dude right down in the middle. I mean, the kids are just, you know, scarred for life, obviously, but uh, scared to death, right? But, you know, watch it. He'd be kind of, you know, saying all this stuff. Well, the, the keynote thing in Okie Finoki's presentation, Okie Finoki Joe's presentation, and if I'm lying, I'm dying. Okay, you can look this up. Is that he would talk about his dog named Swampy, Okay. And Swampy was this little white dog that he that lived in the swamp with Okie Fidoki Joe. But Swampy used to be kind of a house dog and then moved into the swamp with Okie Finoki Joe. And Okie Finoki Joe loves Swampy and Swampy would run around and all that kind of stuff. Well, one day, you know, he's just telling the story, bunch of kids, second grade, first grade, you know, all that stuff. He's telling all about Swampy, pictures of Swampy, all this stuff. And then the story goes, well, Swampy got a little too sure of himself bouncing around the swamp. And then one day he jumped out of the boat and just got chomped in half by an alligator. Okay, the end. <laughs> That's the story. All right. And uh, of course, I remember it 35 years, you know, from 30 years ago. Um, but the, the idea behind, and then he would say this, this is what was funny. He would say, kids, Swampy wasn't swamp wise, okay? He wasn't swamp wise enough. 
And I think about that story and it, it has never left me because I just feel like there is such a realness in that story about what believers got to have. That they've got to have, and this is my point with this. Hey, if all we are is eager, we're going to find ourselves just bouncing around the world as if there is nothing out there. And next thing you know, <laughs> we get chomped in half by an alligator. No, that next thing you know, you know, we end up kind of getting knocked off and suffering happens. And you know what ends up happening, and this is very serious, is that we end up like the story that Jesus told where somebody's faith pops up and they're enthusiastic and then the sun comes out and they're scorched. There's no root. They didn't realize, oh yeah, this is a pretty serious life. It's a pretty hard deal. Hey, Jesus didn't tell us to take off our cross for nothing. Man, you look at the cross, it's brutal, it's super hard. Was there joy on the other side of it? Of course there was. Here's what I wanna tell you today. Y'all, we will suffer, we will face hard things, but you know how the cross frees us to be able to do that? Because we will never endure anything harder than the cross. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, we will never have to cry out, why have you forsaken me? Jesus did that for us. We will have God through it all, through whatever it is. We're gonna need it. Live in a world right now where the hardest countries on earth produce probably, I don't know how many, I read this online, but thousands of martyrs a year. We live in a world, we live in a county, Guilford County. I know many of you guys are probably seeing this in other places, but man, if you're on the Green Clifton and regional campuses uh, and Edgefield campus, man, Guilford County, it's like, man, 65% of the people in this county live under the poverty line. You know, we live in a country where suicide is a top 10 leading cause of death in this nation. There are hard things that we're gonna face. None of them are harder than the cross. We will never be forsaken. Y'all, we need an eagerness in this walk, but we need a patient endurance as well. I think if we grab both of these things with both hands, I think that we are gonna have the opportunity to wait well, all right? Let's wait well on future glory. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and Lord, we pray that our church will be characterized. This week we would be different because of the eagerness in which we wait and the endurance with which we wait. Lord, we wait for future glory. We look forward to that day when you will come in fullness and we will receive the final adoption, the redemption of our bodies and the earth will no longer groan as we steward it well. God, we look forward to that and I pray that looking forward to that would change the way we live today. In Christ's name, amen.